And every one of us should have such passion. Every one of us should live with such purpose, not in chasing uh, the temporary things of this world, no. But we should have passion in reaching this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that the three best analogies for the Christian life we see pictured in the Bible are that it is a battle, it is a marathon, and it is a mission. But the question is, do you have the commitment to endure? On today's program, I will be teaching through Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 24, to highlight the Apostle Paul's incredible perseverance and focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul stayed committed despite hardship, persecution, poverty, ridicule, brushes with death, and even imprisonment. You will be inspired to run the race with your eye on the prize. So grab your Bible, a pen, and your notes, and let's begin our study entitled, Finishing God's Assignment. Well, thank you for coming to church today. Uh, last Sunday was a heart-wrenching day. I walked off the stage uh, at 11 o'clock after this service, and uh, Pastor Tim met me on the side, and he was kind of shaken, and said, did you hear what happened? I said, no, and he told me that Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter crash over here in Calabasas. And if you were not here last weekend, uh, during the nine o'clock hour, because we have services Saturday at 6 and then 9 o'clock. I was preaching, and it was right around 9.40, 9.45. While I was preaching, I had this thing in my sermon where I was explaining that God is greater than any governor. He's greater than any president. He's greater than any Hollywood star. And I said these words, he's greater than any athlete. I said he was greater than LeBron, and I said he's greater than Kobe. That was about 9.40, 9.45. And it was right at that moment during that nine o'clock service, they had, uh, their helicopter had taken off from John Wayne Airport and they, they sent them around Burbank and around Van Nuys Airport up the five. And then they sent them down the 118. And this helicopter was literally over Granada Hills. And then they flew just about the time I was talking about that. They flew right across the valley over to Calabasas in the fog. The helicopter crash, taking the lives of nine people, three of which were 13-year-old girls. And all this week, young and old alike, we have wrestled with this tragedy, the hows and the whys and questions we may never know. But, but not just our hearts, literally, millions of people in our city and millions of people around the world are grieving for the families of those five families, the five of them, imagining the heartache of losing their loved ones so suddenly and so unexpectedly and so painfully. I want to ask that we put up the pictures of those nine people that lost their lives one week ago today. And the Bible says that we as Christians are to rejoice with those who rejoice, but we're also supposed to mourn with those who mourn. You say, why are we to do that? That's called empathy. As Christians, we're to have empathy for people who are hurting. That, that's, part of being, that's part of the DNA of being a Christian, is having compassion for people when they're hurting. And so what I want us to do here before I preach, and I am going to preach, amen. amen. I want us to take just a few moments of silence and uh, just to pray, and then I will have a word of prayer, uh, and we'll pray for these family members of those who lost their lives, okay? Are we good? So let's bow our heads just silently for a few moments, and then, and then I'll pray.
Father, our hearts this week have been um, just been hurting. And we're not really even involved in the lives of those nine people, except maybe we knew of them. And Father, I know that the family members of these nine people, that they must be totally devastated this week, beyond words, beyond description. And we know, God, that as the Bible says, that you are a God of comfort. We know that. We know that's true. That The Bible says that you are a God of comfort, and you comfort us in all of our trials so that we might comfort others with the comfort that we have received from you. And all over this room are people who've gone through difficult times. All over this room are people who've struggled. All, all over this room are people who've gone through heartache and loss. And we have experienced over and over again your comfort. Well, I, I know that wisdom comes from above. The Bible says that. But we also know that comfort comes from above. And Lord, we just ask today, wherever these family members are, as they are still grieving, we just pray on behalf of them, God, that you would bring comfort to them. God, may we, in our own ways, in our own hearts, take advantage of this moment and, and reprioritize our life, not knowing how much time, God, you have allotted each of us here on this planet. Lord, it's kind of strange, but in some way our city is, is more united than we've ever been before. It's, it really is strange. I pray, Father, that we would not let this moment go by and that we would never forget the lessons of this moment and this tragedy. And Lord, I just again ask that you'd be with those family members today. I, I'm sure there's people all over the country praying for them today. I pray that we would lift them up before you. And thank you for bringing us here to church today. I, I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else except right here today. And pray that you would uh, speak to us we know you're real. We sense your presence in this room. We know you are, as we sang that song, how, how great thou art that Mandy led us in. And we know that you're a great God. And I pray, Father, for your blessing on this message, your blessing on the remainder of this service, we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Let's thank the Lord. Can we do that just for his kindness and his goodness? I want you... Uh, Inside your bulletin, there's some sermon notes. I want you to take that uh, outline out. I also uh, want you to take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 20. We're going to look at some verses here, kind of skip around. So you need to have your Bible open uh, to Acts chapter 20. And we're going to look at that and some other verses of Scripture today. This weekend is certainly a weekend of reflection. We ought to be asking ourselves... What is the most important thing in life? What are the most important things in life? First and foremost, most important thing has to be God. It has to be Jesus. It has to be our faith in God, our relationship with Jesus. The matters of faith are most important in life. The second on a pecking order would have to be our family, our friends our children, our loved ones. Amen? Amen? And I would say this week, the third thing on that list would just be realizing that life is but a vapor, that we live in a land of sudden death, that no one is guaranteed tomorrow. You're not even guaranteed that you're going to be here at dinner time tonight. There are no guarantees. The importance of living life with purpose, serving God, fully, completely, every moment of every day, not living for self, but living in the will of God and living for the purposes of God. The Bible, in many different passages, you'll see some of them today, compares our Christian life as a race that's supposed to be won. In your outline, up at the top, the first verse is 1 Corinthians 9, 24, where Paul writes to the church at Corinth, do you not know, in other words, you ought to know this, do you not know that in a race, all of the runners run, but only one gets the what? The prize. However, run in such a way 
as to get the prize. If you're in the race, you should be running, striving to win that prize. And so the question is, are you running to win? Are you fully committed? Are you in it to win it? In Acts chapter 20, I hope you have your Bibles open, Paul was on a missionary journey, and as he was traveling, he came close to a city called Ephesus. He wasn't going to Ephesus, he was just kind of, he was kind of like sailing through, and he got near to Ephesus, and he knew there was a time in his life where he had spent three years living inside that city, working at the church in Ephesus, and he had, he had developed this close uh, personal relationship with the leadership of that church, because they had worked together for three years. And he's on his way through, and he's He's starting to sense as though this would be the last time that he would ever see. And you know, that's the thing about tragedy. You, you, you need to say what you need to say now while you're here because you never know when you're gone or someone else is gone. That, that's, we've all kind of seen that this week. And so he's going through Ephesus and he's like, this might be my last chance to ever see these men that I have worked with and I toiled with for three years working in that church. And so he sends for them because he wants to talk to them one last time. He wants to say a few things uh, knowing that this will be the last chance he'll have. That, that he wants to love them and hug them and visit with them one last time. And if you go down to the very last verse of chapter 20, the very last verse, verse 38, you can see what grieved them the most, these elders, was his statement that they would never see his face again. And so, they're all hurting, they're all grieving because they know they're never going to see each other again. Now, you do know that there are some people, when they're gone, you're not gonna miss them. How many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Paul's case with these Ephesian elders, they were going to miss each other. Why? Because they truly loved each other. They cared about each other. And in the midst of this farewell discussion, because he's not going to see them, he's going on, he's got plans, he's on a missionary journey, he's got things to do. He says these words, now these are his goals, this is his plan. Look at uh, Acts 20, verse 22. He says, now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going on to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, he says in verse 24, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim, my only goal in life, he says, I want to finish the what? I want to finish the race. And he says, I want to complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me. What task was that? He tells you the task of testifying the good news of God's grace. I want you to go up there and see that phrase, finish the race. I want you to, if you have your Bible, circle the word finish. That word finish in the Greek is teleao. And it's a word that means to complete. It's a word that means to fulfill. For those of you that under know your Bible, it is the exact same word that Jesus used on the cross in John 19, verse 30, when he said these words, which were his last words, it is what? Finished. On the cross, Jesus, as he dies, he's saying, I have finished my task of bringing salvation to the whole world. It is complete. My life, I have lived my life fulfilling God's purpose for me here on this earth. But in Acts chapter 20, as Paul is looking out to the rest of his life, he is saying, I too want to fulfill my purpose that God has for me here in this life. I too want to finish God's assignment for my life here on this earth. Now, I want you to go back up and look at verse 24. Look at verse 24 one more time. Look at that verse. What, what, what verse is it? What verse? 24. Say that number one more time. 24. 24. Let's see, who wore that number? Kobe wore that number. 
I know this is going to sound strange to some of you, but I believe that Paul was the first black mamba. <laughs> That's what I believe. You say, why would you say that? Well, you need to study the life of Paul. Paul was tenacious. Paul was laser focused. At one time in his life, he was trying to kill Christians. He was the number one guy in the world persecuting Christians. He was, he was on a mission. And then, and then God turned his life around. He became a Christian. And God turned his life completely. He, had, he took that same tenaciousness, but now he's using it to lead people to Jesus Christ. He, he, he Paul, you got to study his life. He outworked everyone in finishing God's assignment for him. And every one of us, should have such passion. Every one of us should live with such purpose, not in chasing the temporary things of this world, no. But we should have passion in reaching this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to live, you know, we're talking about the rest of this year, maybe the next 10 years, the next, I, I want to live the rest of my days here on this earth. I, however much time God gives me preaching and teaching and reaching every single person in this city so that at the end of my time here on this earth, as I look back over my life, I can say I have finished the race, I have completed the task, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. I don't really have time to adequately explain how Paul did without question. He spent the rest of his life on this earth completing God's assignment for his life. If you look at verse 21, he said, I have, de I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He said these words down in verse 26 and 27. He said, therefore, I am innocent of the blood of all men. What's that mean? He, he can say, he can, this is what he means. If anybody dies, I'm innocent of their blood because I have without question done everything in my power to help lead them to Christ. He says in verse 27, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Can you say that? Can you say I'm innocent of the blood of everyone in my family if they die and they end up in a place called hell? It's not going to be on my hands because I did everything I could do possibly to lead them to Jesus Christ. Can you say that about everyone on your block? That I am innocent of the blood of all the people in my city. I'm innocent of the blood of all the people where I work because I have without question, I have not hesitated to tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you say those words? Paul could because he was relentless. He was fearless. He was persistent. He didn't go on one missionary journey. He didn't go to two missionary journeys. He didn't go to three missionary journeys. He went on four missionary journeys. You say, well, that's not that big of a deal. Oh, yes, it was. Back in those days, they had no modern trans transportation. They didn't have cars back in those days. They didn't have cell phones back in those days. Most of you couldn't last 24 hours without your cell phone. They didn't think about this. They didn't have light bulbs back in those days. There was no electricity. There were no refrigerators. There were no gas-powered engines. There were no Teslas. There were no Ubers, no planes, no trains, no internet, no Airbnb, no Southwest Airlines. They didn't have motorcycles. They didn't have bicycles. They didn't even have roller skates back in those days. And yet he left and went on four of these journeys trying in every city he went to. He was planting churches in almost every city. The Bible says that he spoke in the synagogue each and every weekend. And the rest of the week, day by day, he was knocking on doors and going inside houses and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And at the very end, now this is kind of complicated. In, in 1 Corinthians 9, he's saying, this is my goal, this is my aim. But by the time you get to 2 Timothy, which is the second verse in your outline, he's now at the end of his life. Nero has thrown him into a, a prison called the Mamertine Prison, which is in Rome. It is dark. It is cold. 
The sewer from the Colosseum goes right through it. It smells. There are rats. And at the very end of his life, as he's in that prison, he's not getting out. When he gets out, Nero's going to cut his head off. He's at the end of his life. And the very last book that he writes, while he's inside that prison, they're going to take him out and cut his head off. His very last words that he writes is 2 Timothy. And as he looks back over his life, he says these words in 2 Timothy 4, 6, For I have already been poured out like a drink offering. The time has come for my departure. And he says in verse 7, I have, see back in 1 Corinthians, he was saying, this is what I want to do. Now he's at the end of his life and he looks back and he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Number one, I have fought the good fight quickly. The Christian life is a battle. It's not easy being a Christian. Some of you think, I'll become a Christian. Everything's going to be rosy-dozy in my life. No, it's not going to be rosy-dozy. Now, there are always good things and bad things to argue over. The battle between good and evil, right and wrong, is always a battle worth fighting. That's a good battle. Fighting for the life of an unborn child, that's a good fight. That's a good fight. They clapped a lot louder at that than the other two services. Just so you know. Fighting, fighting for racial equality and justice, that is a good fight to fight. You need to fight that battle. Fighting to save your marriage when it's falling apart. You need to keep fighting. Don't give up. Don't give up. <laughs> fighting to protect your children from the culture in which we live that is trying to take your child and sweep them out to sea. You keep fighting for the life of your child. The most important fight that any of us fight is the battle that's being waged for the soul of man. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 26, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeit his soul? You keep fighting to see men and women get saved. Some issues aren't worth fighting over. Fighting over a parking spot <laughs> is petty. <laughs> fighting over your neighbor's barking dog It's not worth getting upset over. Fighting over the fact that your child got a B when they should have got an A. It's not worth arguing over. Nobody cares. <laughs> Fighting over the fact that the line at the coffee shop is just too long and too slow. Relax. There's another coffee, 10,000 coffee shops around the corner. Relax. You're wasting your time and energy on so many small things that don't really matter when you could be fighting for something really important like leading your friends or your family to Jesus Christ. That's worth fighting over. <laughs> Paul said back in Acts 20, verse 31, he says, remember, he said those guys remember that for three years. I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. What is, what is he saying? He's saying every day for three years, every day that I was with you, I was teaching, I was warning, I was, I had this, I, he was crying, he was so involved emotionally in their spiritual journey. Hey, I want to tell you something that you might not be aware of, but every single month, like clockwork, I send out a devotional via the internet to every listener, to everyone who signs up. It's free, there's no charge. All you have to do is to go to our website, liftupjesus.com, go up to the tab that says Know and Grow. Check on that tab and you'll find my blog. Log on to my blog and there's a place for you to sign up today 
And from now until you cancel it every single month, you will hear from me in your mailbox, your Dropbox. We're going to send you a personal devotional from Lift Up Jesus from my heart into your heart into your home. And you'll start getting your devotionals this week. God bless you and do this today. Hey, thank you for joining in today in our program. I don't know about you, but I just love our program. I love lifting up the person of Jesus Christ. I say this all the time. I think we have the best name for any television ministry going, to lift up Jesus. We need people like you who watch this program, who believe in this program, who understand the intent of our heart to come alongside and to support this ministry. And I know that some of you can do a little, some can do a lot. It's whatever God puts on your heart. But together, I know we can make a difference. We get letters from people all over this country. If we've blessed you, we want to hear from you. But I want to encourage you today that if this ministry has been something that has changed your heart or kept you on the right path or helped you out in some way spiritually, as it's helped you, I know it will help others. If only we can get this broadcast on other stations around this country. I want to thank all of you who've ever done anything to help support this ministry. We would not be here without our partners. But we'd like to encourage others to come along and join us. And thank you again for tuning in to Lift Up Jesus. And together as we lift him up, I know that we will change this world because Jesus is the light of this world and he'll change each and every heart. You know, Pastor Dudley enjoys hearing from everyone watching him through this ministry. Your emails, phone calls, and social media contacts are very important to him. We want you to know you can also write to Pastor Dudley at our mailing address, Lift Up Jesus Ministry, 19700 Rinaldi Street, Port Ranch, California, 91326. Again, that's Lift Up Jesus Ministry, 19700 Rinaldi Street, Port Ranch, California, 91326. Your financial support, large or small, is greatly appreciated. You can be assured your gifts to this ministry go directly to help touch and change the lives of many who are hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ for the very first time. Someone just like you helped us to be here on this station you're watching right now. Your partnership gift can help us reach into more cities and to new viewers across America in the very same way. So if Lift Up Jesus has been a blessing to you, please take just a moment to write, call, or visit our website and click the Give button today.